Good morning and welcome to today's town hall focusing on the university's budget outlook. This hour we'll be focusing on questions from faculty and staff members. We've been taking your questions for about a week now and we've received over a hundred already, but please continue to submit your questions live through the Google Forms on this website, liveevents.psu.edu. We've received many similar questions already, so I may combine them or pick one question that represents the larger group just so that we can get to more of the topics that you've submitted. And so again, please continue to submit your questions to liveevents.psu.edu, the Google Forms at the bottom of your screen. And now I want to welcome to her very first Penn State Town Hall, President Neely Bendapudi. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much, Ben. It's truly a pleasure to be here with you. And joining her will be Sarah Thorndike, the Vice President for Finance and Business. Good morning. Good morning. Justin Schwartz, our Interim Executive Vice President and Provost. And Jennifer Wilkes, our Interim Vice President for Human Resources. Thank you all for joining us. Happy to be here. Mm -hmm. uh, Dr. Bendapudi, would you like to start us off with a few words? I would love to. Thank you very much. Good morning, everybody. I am in month five on the job, and it's been a delight. I truly love being here. Every day I see what makes Penn State so special. Think about the excellence that we have, the world-class university we are, on our teaching, our research, our service dimensions, what we do by extension. I also love our land-grant mission. We are here for access and affordability so that people can improve their lives through higher education. We are here to make an economic impact for the Commonwealth, the country and beyond, but certainly for the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. And I love that our mission is research that makes an impact. At the same time, I've also discovered some challenges. That's not atypical. I would characterize the biggest of these as our budget challenge. And I know we can do this because part of what makes us Penn State is that we say we are. We're not a culture that says I am. There's such wisdom, such beauty in saying it's we are. So today I want to begin by saying, I feel very confident we can tackle these challenges and come out on the other end stronger, better than ever. And that's partly because of the three team members joining me here today. I want each of you to know I could not ask for better colleagues and partners. And now I wanna tell you all why this town hall. I wanted to do this because I realized that even among the senior most leadership levels, not everyone was fully aware that last year we had a pretty significant deficit. And so I figured uh, many of them thought it was one time that it was just COVID. The reality though is it's a structural deficit, meaning it's not a one-time deal. We need to figure out an answer. And again, consistent with the we are spirit, it's important to me that all of us have a common understanding. We're a, a university that belongs to every single one of us. And so I wanted to have this forum to hear from you and to share some of my observations as well. So when I look at the deficit and look at the fact that the board has given us a little extra time, they're going to approve our budget in September as opposed to July when they would have done it. Uh, I wanted to make sure you all knew the board is not the bad guy here. Their fiduciary responsibility is to make sure we are on solid footing. And no institution, you know this, you balance your budget at home, no one can run up a deficit forever. We need to be good stewards of our resources so we can invest in our students, invest in our faculty and staff, and make Penn State better. How do we tackle this? It's rather simple. I made a couple of notes, so pardon me when I look at it. It's really a three-pronged approach. One, we need to look at our revenues. We cannot just cut our way to excellence. So we need to say, what are our revenue streams? And what are we going to do to position us for success? One of the most important things that we can control uh, where our revenues are concerned is our tuition. So I don't know how many of you are aware, but over the last five years, uh, enrollment in our Commonwealth campuses declined by about 20%. So think about the impact that would have. Uh, we'll talk about it, I'm sure. 
I think our Commonwealth campuses are our strength. They are our opportunity, but they need help. One of the biggest things I learned in visiting the campuses is we need focused enrollment strategy. So I'm very pleased that we've hired somebody to head up enrollment management so we can control our destiny better. That actually puts us on par with other Big Ten and other universities across the country. Uh, we've got to do that. A second element is how do we control our costs? We've got to, especially in the short run. As you know, we've got to find a way to control our costs. I want you to know that we are doing that at every single level. For example, uh, you may have seen our GC, Steve Dunham, is stepping down from the GC role October 1. And I've asked Frank Guadagnino, our VP for administration, to step in as interim GC. But all of the functions that Frank used to have now will report to my chief of staff. So we are not replacing that role. All I'm using that as an example of how at every single level, we've got to be mindful and say, what can we do to control costs? By the way, I, we, I'm sure there'll be questions about strategic hiring, so I'll pause on that. I want you to know it was strategic uh, stop to hiring. We are continuing to hire many, many critical roles. The last part that I want to mention is our budget model. And that is the fact that Penn State, as I look at it, is like a house, a beautiful home, where some rooms are fabulous. They're, fa they're like WPSU studio, they're beautiful. Mm -hmm. But some rooms are falling <clears throat> apart. And when we say we are, when we say we are one home, you know that we cannot have that. So we really need to look at our budget model. How are we allocating resources? Do we need to rethink? Are we being equitable? Uh, so these are some of the issues we should look at. My final point to you is, we will do this collaboratively. Uh, we have shared with Faculty Senate, with uh, USAC, with that's our uh, Staff Advisory Council, uh, working with deans, chancellors, and I will tell you that this team here, uh, both Justin and Sarah, have been hosting weekly meetings with our deans, with our chancellors, with our, their financial officers, so that we can all get on the same page. I thank you, and uh, as I said, I could not be more excited. I feel I'm where I need to be, and I know the potential and promise. Uh, we are the most resilient organization around, so I know we can do this as long as we know it's we are and we are tackling things together. With that, let me turn it over to Sarah. Thanks, Neely. I really appreciate it. So I, I want to start by sharing that Penn State's balance sheet is very healthy. We have strong donor support. We have excellent funding for major research. And you probably recall hearing that we just raised $2.2 billion in a capital campaign, which is fantastic. The challenge before us is only 1% of those contributions are unrestricted. So although they're wonderful for scholarships and for other donor-specified needs, they don't help us actually operate the budget in a, in a way that works for us. And so we are very grateful for the research money. We have over a billion dollars, but again, research dollars are also restricted. So really what we're trying to do is get our operating budget in order. We do continue to operate at sub-inflation rates, both from state funding and tuition. And again, that, that's a challenge for us because those are two of our bigger revenue buckets, both tuition and state funding. But I do want to say this is a challenge, but it is not a crisis. We really have some runway here to, again, get our operating budget in order and work with everybody to do that. I'm confident we're taking the steps forward um, that will get us into a great place. As Neely mentioned, the board has given us a little bit of extra time. Uh, we will be taking our budget for fiscal year 23 to them next week. Normally, would, we would have done that in July. And Thanks to the unit heads, the budget executives, we have made tremendous progress on what our budget deficit looked like back in July compared to what it looks like now. So I'm confident that the board will approve the budget and we will continue to make even more strides and progress forward with the help of everyone. As Neely mentioned, this is a multi-pronged approach. We need to look at revenues, 
tuition, um, additional new revenues. You might have heard about our corporate sponsorship program we're working on. We need to look at expenses. That's part of why we did the strategic hiring freeze, to give us some runway, to give us some breathing room as we figure out how to manage our expenses. And we're also looking at the budget allocation model. We have a fantastic group of faculty, staff, and administrators from across the university that are helping us redesign our budget allocation model. We have a pretty aggressive schedule, and it's out of necessity because, as Neely mentioned, we really can't continue to operate in a deficit environment. So we're going to roll that new budget allocation model out before the end of this calendar year, right around Thanksgiving. And again, it's going to take the work of everyone to then take that new allocation and put it into practice for fiscal year 24 and fiscal year 25. We're also going to work with the legislature on trying to get our state appropriations to a, a level that's more um, consistent with what we see across, across Pennsylvania. Um, we are the lowest funded within Pennsylvania. We get about $5,600 per Pennsylvania um, student. And that's, and that's lower than, than Pitt or Temple or Pashi, and, and we're confident we can work together and see our state appropriations um, increase. Pennsylvania is also ranked 47th out of 50. And so, again, those are some of the challenges we have before us that we will continue to advocate and work on this next year. So I'm confident, again, with the great groups of people that we have working on our budget allocation model, the new revenue ideas that we have, and all the expense reductions, that we're going to end up in a great place. Thank you both for that. And once again, I'd like to remind our audience members that they can continue to submit their questions live throughout this event. But now let's get to those questions. Um, Sarah, we'll begin with you. And uh, it was touched on in the opening statements, but uh, it, it bears repeating because it's on a lot of people's minds. What is the university doing to control the budget and reduce the deficit? Yeah, thanks so much. So again, we have a very solid foundation that we're starting to work from, and but we have taken some practical steps. Um, we had a 3% budget rescission built into the fiscal year 23 budget. Um, we've been planning on that for many months. It's gonna save us about $46 million. And frankly, a, a lot of that budget deficit gets reinvested back into things like the general salary increase. It's just where we're at right now where we have to redistribute some of our existing money. Again, we've done a, a temporary strategic hiring freeze. That will give us, again, some runway as we think about how do we use some of those budget savings perhaps in a different way. Um, we will also be working on the new budget allocation model. We've hired um, NACUBO, which is the National Association for College and University Business Officers. They have a consulting group that's made up of, of retired, experienced chief budget officers, chief business officers, chief financial officers, who really can help us understand what some of our peers have done um, that are comparable to us and other creative ways to think about our new budget allocation model so that we can try to be as fair and equitable as possible. Again, we're going to focus on new revenue strategies as well. Thank you very much. And this is a question we received a couple of times. And it's uh, one of those good news, bad news situations. Penn State just announced that we, re we raised $2.2 billion. Why can't some of that money be used to offset the deficit? It's a great question. Um, so 50% of what we raised goes into endowments. And we are so grateful for every dollar we received. We use it for important strategic needs. But when a, a donor gives money towards an endowment, their actual gift can't be used. All it can do is continue to grow, which again is fantastic. And then we get the income off that gift. Right now we take about 5% a year off of those gifts for things like scholarships, maybe endowed professorships, maybe for um, buildings. But having most of that campaign go to restricted gifts, again, it was 99%, it doesn't really help us fix broken windows or replace carpets or, or pay for staff salaries. And so it's such an important part of our finances. It's, it's what makes our balance sheet really strong. It's what helps support our students. But we have other means that we have to figure out in order to actually make the, the budget work. Thank you. And what is the major source of that deficit? So it's a variety of things. Um, the pandemic didn't, didn't help. We had quite a few expenses related to the pandemic. We also have seen, as Neely mentioned, a decline in, in enrollment over that time, particularly at our campuses. It gives us opportunity to see that enrollment increase as well. Um, 
There's been significant inflation. I know you've all felt it personally. The university has, has felt it significantly as well. Um, our state funding is lower than it was in, in fiscal year 2010, 2011. So with that stagnant state funding, it's been a challenge. And, and because of all of that, we've really been using our central reserves for reoccurring expenses, which is just not sustainable. President Bendapudi, you'd like to add something? Yes, Sarah, uh, would you speak to that a little bit because not everyone uh, might use the same jargon. Sure. So what happens when we use one-time central funds for recurring expenses? Yeah, thank you, Neely. Um, so I'll, I'll give you a good example. If you're hiring, say, a, a, a faculty or a staff member, you expect to pay them every year. If you're only paying them out of one-time money, money that will go away over time, you can't continue to pay them in perpetuity. So we really need a perpetual reoccurring revenue source, and that's what really should be in our budget for things like salaries or multi-year contracts for like IT, um, our utilities, those, those types of expenses. You would never want to pay them with just one-time money that goes away. Thank you. Yep. And Sarah, as a follow-up, if I could just ask, do you have any idea when the budget will be balanced? Uh, we're getting some questions live about the timing issues. Yeah, no, it's a great question. So we've been grateful to say that we have reserves um, and we've, we are managing this early enough that we've got runway for a couple years of reserves, assuming we continue over that time to reduce the deficit. So the board has given us until the summer of 2025 to get the budget into a balanced situation. So um, again, the original request for funding in July of this year was a much bigger deficit. We've already made wonderful progress of bringing that down through some central savings and through unit savings. Some of those are permanent savings, some are temporary because things have been delayed like a capital project or the purchase of an equipment item or we've held a position vacant. Um, so we have significantly already reduced the deficit we saw just a few months ago. There's a lot of work still to be done to get that deficit down over the next two years to a balanced budget by 2025. Okay, thank you for that update. And uh, just one more question for you, and then I promise we will give you a little bit of a break. <laughs> uh, but how has the university been engaging faculty, staff, and the various stakeholders we have here at the university yeah. in this process? Yeah, it is so critically important. I, I can't solve this on my own. Um, I need everybody's help. We need everybody's help. And so we've been engaging many, many um, levels across the university in a variety of ways. So we have um, weekly budget meetings with the Academic Leadership Council, which is all of our deans and chancellors, our financial officers, um, and our president's council so that they all understand the challenge before them and can speak with their teams. I've met with a variety of units across the university in finance and business and student affairs and academics, um, the staff advisory council, um, faculty senate, really to make sure everybody knows what the challenge is before us so that we can all work on it together. Um, the budget allocation model work group includes deans and a chancellor and administrators, um, a faculty member who has an expertise in this space. So we're really trying to engage across the board the campus. If I may, Sarah, we also have uh, the chair of faculty senate on that group yep. because, again, it's important that we work collaboratively. And I want to remind everybody what Sarah said. I have made a commitment to the board as CEO that in, uh, by summer 2025, we will get to a balanced budget. Thank you for that. Uh, Justin, I wonder if you could expand a little bit on just how <coughs> faculty have been engaged. A couple names and titles were mentioned there. Sure, thank you very much and good morning everyone. So I don't want to reiterate uh, all of the different engagements that, that Sarah just talked about in terms of deans and chancellors and, and how we're talking to them. I think the additional piece um, that we haven't mentioned yet is engagement with the faculty senate across the board. So at yesterday's plenary we spoke quite a bit about the budget and, and the situation we're in. And so one of the, the responses from the Senate was you know, that we had previously created a joint committee on the university budget. This was actually news to me. I think it might have been news to Sarah also. Um, and so we were asked if we would re-engage that, that group. And you know, it wasn't just that we were willing to. I think we're actually very happy to. 
Um, we know that we have a lot of expertise um, and, and people who have been working at this university for a long time, and we need all of the voices and all of their input to help us not just balance the budget, but we have to balance the budget right. We need to get to um, the right distribution of our resources, the right budget model for allocating to support our programs, and this really needs the voices of everyone to be involved. Thank you. Uh, we've received close to 10 questions about uh, the Commonwealth campuses and their long-term future. It's obviously a very important topic for many people. Dr. Pinduti, I'd like to direct this to you. Um, what is the long-term plan? And specifically, we've been asked, are there any plans to close <coughs> any of our Commonwealth campuses? There are no plans to close any of the Commonwealth campuses. And as I said, I really think that's the strength it truly really was one of the things that drew me to this opportunity at Penn State. The fact that 96% of the citizens of this Commonwealth are within 30 miles of one of our locations. What a powerful statement that is. But, and having been at the campuses, and actually several of them multiple times, I will tell you that when you are there on the ground, you realize these campuses are the social, economic, cultural, centers of those communities. So what we do need to do is make sure they continue to stay vibrant and that we are, we give the chancellors, uh, Dr. Kelly Austin, our vice president for Commonwealth campuses, brings this up at every single meeting. And that's what his job is, to make sure that we realize the strength of the Commonwealth campuses and invest in them to grow. Thank you. Uh, Justin, I'd like to ask you, uh, what about any specific programs, units or departments? Are there any plans to make cuts there here at University Park and across the Commonwealth campuses? Thank you. I know this is a topic that's on everybody's mind. Um, and so let me just say clearly up front, as Neely just did about the campuses, we have no immediate plans to cut or eliminate any of the programs. We will do take a period of time where we plan and assess and ask ourselves the question of, are all these programs the right programs? Um, I think another important point that we haven't really touched on that we have to really stress is that while we're talking a lot about the budget and the need to balance the budget and develop a new allocation model, those are all front and center on our minds in the conversation. But every one of those conversations really does center around how do we build a budget that supports our students and supports our faculty to meet our mission, our vision, and our values. So we know that our mission is to ensure that all of our students have the academic opportunities so they can really build the lives and careers that they're aspiring to. That's really the driving force of how we look at what programs do we have and what programs should we, should we add or, or, or eliminate. We do have duplications, there's no doubt. I get asked all the time, why do we have duplications? Why do we have the same program at multiple campuses? There is nothing wrong with us having duplication. We are a very large university. We are distributed across the entire state. Um, and so for us to meet the needs of our students, we have to have some duplications. So the question that we'll be asking deans and chancellors and department heads and faculty to really think about is, do we have any unnecessary duplications? Do we have programs which, um, when they were created and, and thrived, were really critical to our students, to our economy, to our state, to our nation? But maybe they're not the key programs that we need anymore because the world has changed. These will not be top-down decisions. I am, none of us in, in this room want to look across our programs and say, well, we don't need that one, we don't need this one. What we do need to do, and in any strong organization will do this, is look at the programs that we have at that unit level, at the dean, chancellor, department head level, and ask the question, is that program still worth having? Does it still support our mission? Uh, or would the resources be better used creating a different program or building a different program? Thank you very much. Uh, Jennifer, I'd like to direct a question to you, and it's uh, something to, to maybe there's some fear amongst our community. Are there any plans for any mass layoffs or furloughs as an attempt to balance this budget? Yeah, thank you for that question, Ben, and good morning, everybody. We have no plans for mass layoffs. There may be some personnel changes in units, largely based to attrition or not backfilling vacant positions. And while some reductions in some units are possible, we are not planning for any mass layoffs. 
We all value our employees so much. I care about our employees deeply. Um, and we realize we cannot meet the mission of our university without our employees. So we certainly want to minimize the impact that something like this would have on our university um, uh, workforce. Budget executives in each of their units will be tasked with making decisions that are in the best interest of their unit to support our students and for the betterment of the university. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, we've received this question maybe a dozen times. Uh, will there be a voluntary early retirement has been done in the past to perhaps entice some with higher salaries to leave and help balance the budget that way? Um, I would, Sarah, is that a question for you? Yeah, I'm happy to answer that question. We looked at it, and the reality is, given where the labor market is and pressures, we just don't think we're going to save any money with that option. So we do not have any plans to do a university-wide um, plan in that regard. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, and we've had another reoccurring theme amongst the questions submitted to us, and that is that staff morale is, as some people described it, an all-time low from their time here at Penn State. Dr. Bendapudi, what can you do and what are you doing to address that morale issue? This is such an important question. Some of you may know that I've written about this and have studied this. It's something near and dear to my heart. And the answer to staff morale, part of that will lie with us as senior leaders, for sure. But the reality is, if you look at the literature, if you see what's happening, it's also how we treat one another. What are we going to do? So staff at every place I know feel the most vulnerable many times because students, we realize we are here to serve them. Faculty, I joke, we have the sage on stage aura, you know, we get up and we're the ones giving the lectures. Staff are truly uh, so critical to any university. I call them the connective tissue. They hold the institution together. So some of the things I would ask is that we be mindful and respectful of one another. Give each other a little bit of grace. We're coming out of a period of great stress. The pandemic put a lot of stress on us because as human beings, under stress, we are wired to come together. And the pandemic meant not only were we stressed, but we needed to be isolated from one another. So here's a simple rule. I've told my leadership team, so I would tell you all the same thing. Everybody is entitled to have a bad day. We just cannot all have a bad day on the same day. <laughs> so maybe you create something in your group where you say, I call dibs, today I'm gonna to be a grouch. <laughs> but everybody else has to pick up. Uh, we will do our best. We will do our best. As you can see, even the fact that we got some modest uh, you know, salary increase for everybody was important to me because we knew that people have been working very, very hard and we wanted to show that this is an urgent issue, but it's not panic. We've got this. I am a retired banker, if you will, a business person. I feel confident we'll get there. But I want to say it's not just the uh, money, it's how we treat one another. And we truly need to make sure we treat each other with the respect we deserve. Thank you. Uh, following up on the morale issue, many people noted specifically, uh, we've had more than 20 questions on the topic of the hiring freeze and how that's affecting their workloads. People say that they feel overworked and understaffed already and this hiring freeze is compounding that issue. So how can we both hire qualified new employees and manage the workload of our, our existing employees? Ooh, well, uh, oh. We'll start with you, Dr. Mm -hmm. Ben. Oh, sorry. <laughs> and Ben, you know it's Neely. Mm -hmm. uh, From now on. I will take Dr. Ben Dupudi for sure, but <laughs> yes. Um, this is a very important issue, and I may ask anyone else who wants to jump in on this too. We call it a strategic hiring freeze, and Justin and Sarah will tell you we have approved, a they have approved a lot of hires. So the critical nature of this, and I realize everybody's working hard, Everybody's doing extra, and I thank you for it. But the decisions about which are the critical roles that must be filled are appropriately being decided at the unit level. So I'd encourage you to talk to your <coughs> dean, your chancellor, a member of a vice president, vice provost. That's where those decisions are being made. Thank you. 
Uh, Jennifer, we have a question for you. We've received about a dozen questions along the lines of the Compensation Modernization Initiative. And what can you tell us about that? Do you have any timing updates on that? Sure. So the goal of this program was to modernize our job classification and compensation program. The job classification side of the project is focused on creating new job profiles, new job descriptions, um, a new structure for job leveling, and to provide more insight into career paths for staff employees. The compensation side of the program has been focused on creating a new uh, compensation philosophy and a new compensation structure based on market data. So to date, we've done a lot of work. We have met with over 1,700 staff employees. We have reviewed thousands of job descriptions and we have written hundreds of new job profiles. One of the great things about this project is that we do have, we will have more job profiles than we do now that more accurately describe what our employees do, which I think is a great thing. So once we finished all of that work, we mapped all of our staff employees into this new job structure. We sent that information out to the leadership teams throughout the university to review the data and to validate that. We're in the process now of getting the feedback from that review, and so we're taking that information and finalizing the job classification part of the program. The next part will be for us to build out the compensation components of the, the plan. We expect that we will have more information for employees, including training on how this new program will work in the early part of 2023. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Uh, Sarah, I'm gonna follow up with you on that. Uh, can you give us any, from your perspective, how, when we could see some tangible results and how that might affect our budget? Yeah, it's a great question. And I know it's on everybody's minds. Jennifer and I have been staying really in close contact once we have a better sense of what the comp modernization results show as far as what we need to increase our compensation um, expenses to be, we'll have a better sense then as we're reallocating out the budget model, thinking about where new revenues go, thinking about how we might reduce other expenses to appropriately and strategically uh, fund the comp modernization in, in as quick a timeline as we possibly can. So that is still under development. Okay, thank you very much. Um, one of the core missions of a university is obviously education. So, Justin, a question for you. Are all of the faculty positions that are open being considered critical? Thank you. So, I think it's important to remember that not only are open faculty positions critical, but filled faculty positions are critical, too. All of our faculty are, are essential. Um, I'm going to split this into separate uh, categories. First, let me talk about our non-tenure track uh, faculty. So when the strategic hiring freeze first was announced, uh, there was a lot of concern, for good reason, that we were in the process of posting and searching and interviewing uh, for non-tenure line faculty who are going to be teaching this fall. We very quickly uh, built up a system so we could have all of those positions uh, submitted for exception. We approved 100% of those positions. There is a, a resounding mantra in, throughout this, the hiring freeze that we are not going to disrupt the fundamental mission of the university. We're going to support our students. We're going to you know, have faculty in the classrooms um, in an effective way. So those positions were immediately designated as critical in the context of the strategic hiring freeze. All tenure line faculty positions are also critical, um, but we need to assess them in a little bit of a different way than we do the non-tenure line faculty. Because when we hire a tenure line faculty member, um, we are thinking about this, we're aiming to have her, him, or them with Penn State for 30 years or longer. And so this assessment process for a faculty, an open tenure line faculty position isn't because of the strategic hiring freeze or, or the budget model transition per se. And this is something I've done throughout my, my career in leadership in academia as a department head and as a dean. When we have an open tenure track position, tenure line position, we'd assess what we want to do in terms of what our needs are for the next 30 years, not simply what type of, of disciplinary expertise did the person who leave have, right? So we're not trying to backfill um, based on the past, we're trying to fill a position looking forward, and that's really critical. Uh, the other thing, if I could take another moment on this topic, because I think it's really important that, that the audience understands the process here. Um, I know there was concern uh, when the, um, model transitioned from budget authority, 70% of the budget authority under the provost to being um, all unified under uh, one CFO. 
Um, there were a lot of questions. Will Sarah's office be making academic decisions? So I can tell you um, with 100% clarity that there was not uh, a finance and business office driven decision making process for choosing which tenure line faculty searches to launch. All of those, the process that we went through was that the deans and chancellors assessed what their needs were. The chancellors worked through Kelly Austin. That, that process actually began before I took on this role. Um, all the University Park deans put together their list of prioritizations for what faculty positions they wanted to fill, what areas of, of expertise in the larger colleges, which departments, um, but in general, what area of need that they had. Um, they submitted those to me with the rank order. I reviewed them in a couple cases, reached out to the deans and had more conversations. Uh, for positions that were going to be co-hires with an institute, for example, um, I asked the dean to reconfirm with the institute director that they were still on board because I knew the institute budgets were also going through, through conversations. Um, and then those decisions were made by me and the deans were, were approved to do their launches. So we are viewing all of our faculty positions as critical, and I think we should always have a process where we think about where do we make a 30-year investment uh, when we have the opportunity to do so. Thank you. Uh, Jennifer, we'll go to the next question to you. We've received about a dozen questions uh, circling around staff workload and their compensation. Uh, this one appears to be representative of the bunch. A staff assistant says and feels like they are taking on more responsibilities due to other positions not being filled or maybe can't be filled because they feel that the offering salary is too low and they want to know why they aren't being compensated for that extra work. Yeah, thank you for that question. We realize that there are a lot of people that are doing more with less right now. And we appreciate your efforts in that regard. To me, it, it kind of gets back to what Neely was saying earlier about the we are. Um, we know that we're asking a lot of people to chip in, in in areas that maybe they haven't before. We have a process in place to give employees additional compensation if they have taken on additional duties, and we do that frequently. But every situation has to be looked at on an individual basis. There are many situations where it's very appropriate to give someone additional compensation. There may, for example, be a situation where someone may have capacity in their job. And so in that situation, giving someone extra duties maybe shouldn't result in additional compensation. So we really have to look at each situation individually. And if any of you out there have questions about this, I would really encourage you to talk with your supervisor. Please reach out to your HR strategic partner to talk through these individual situations and we'd be happy to to walk you through it. Mm. Thank you. Uh, Neely, this next <laughs> question is for you. Uh, a person noted coming in that uh, retention is also at an all-time low. So mm -hmm. what is the university doing to attract and retain our top talent? Uh, I did not realize that it was also at the low, as you said, we need to verify these numbers, I don't know. But that's a very, very excellent point. Whoever asked that I've often talked about organizations are like leaky buckets. So whether it's your PTO group, your church group, whether it's a, a business, and our university is no different. And here's what I mean. We're all so excited about bringing in new people. So let's say you have a, a bucket at home and you're filling it up with your favorite beverage. That's terrific. But if there are holes in the bucket where you're routinely losing people, then no matter what you do, uh, it doesn't make sense. You're not going to ever be uh, optimizing. So if it were a real issue in your home, I hope the first thing you would do is plug up those holes. So this is actually interesting. A conversation I had with some faculty and staff just a couple of days ago. Do we always invest in just bringing someone new? Or should we also be paying attention to the people that we already have here? I worry sometimes that we take for granted the people we already have, and we are excited about the new and shiny. So you will see that I will always say, what are we doing to retain the people that we have recruited and uh, make sure that we invest there as well? Always it's a balance. Thank you. Uh, Neely, we will stay with you for this next question, and it's one we have received several times. People are asking about increases to senior administration salary and the hiring and creating of new senior level positions, uh, and particularly clo so close to the announcement of a hiring freeze. Um, can you tell us a little bit about the reasoning behind those moves? Thank you very much. I really appreciate it. Uh, and I've tried to address this with uh, people as this comes up. The, the higher of the enrollment management role, 
I always knew it was critical. I noticed we didn't have a dedicated function here, but that really was solidified for me when I traveled to the Commonwealth campuses. If there was one theme that every single chancellor, Kelly Austin, faculty, staff at these campuses brought up, it was we need to do something that is a cohesive, Penn State-wide look at enrollment. As I've said before, that's the only part of our revenue stream that we have some control over. The state will go after, we'll do our best to increase our appropriations. Donors, we'll cer certainly try to uh, work with them, research, but all of those come with strings attached in terms of where we spend it. So I am very happy we hired that role, it's critical. And I hope you heard me that we are also trying to say where are places we do not need to hire another person. So with somebody stepping into the interim GC role, we have eliminated the VP for administration role. I will tell you the simple thing for me on all of these decisions is the return on investment. Is the hire we are making going to make a difference overall for everybody in this university? And that's the only metric I use. I also did increase salaries for some of the women on the team. And I will tell you that when I came in and looked at it as a new person uh, at the senior level salaries, I discovered an equity issue that uh, the women were systematically below, significantly below the median, and most of the men were above the median. It is not a gender argument, you know. I want you to know, people might say, oh, what if the woman only has one year experience, the man has 20, or it's not about that. It is people holding the role, so controlling for everything else. I am a market researcher after all. I felt that we needed to address this inequity. I will also tell you, as the boss, for me, the issue is what will happen if we lose this person? What's the value? What is the return? And how critical is this role? So I'm very proud of the decisions I've made, and I know you will see the payoff as well. And you also have my word that we will work as hard as anyone else in the university. I've always said that we lead by example. So if there are other questions, I'll, I'm happy to address. We do have another question uh, specifically about raises and inflation. Uh, it was noted by several people that submitted that their raises have not kept up with inflation for several years. Right. It was noted that that means, and essentially, they are making less than when they started. Is there a plan to address that? And we've had specific calls to ask if there will be a return to merit-based raises. I certainly hope so. You all know that I've been in this role. I've had four full months here. And I, too, was, did not realize. Uh, not prepared is not the right answer. I'd like to think I am prepared. But I certainly did not anticipate the financial challenges we're facing today. And from the outside, there's only so much research that you can do and dig into it. And so I am very committed to making sure that over time, we come back to fiscal health so that everybody can be compensated appropriately and feels valued. The point about uh, pay compression, where people have been here a long time, not keeping up with inflation, is very, very real. This year, remember, the board gave us a couple of months to come back to them with a better budget that they would approve. So certainly, I'm thankful to the board for approving something across the board, because everybody has been feeling the pinch of lack of increases. But over time, I'm hoping we get to both cost of living adjustments, but just as importantly, or even more importantly, some sort of merit increases so that we can recognize and retain our stars, the people who are going above and beyond. Thank you. Uh, Justin, we have one for you, and it comes mm -hmm. specifically from a Commonwealth campus employee, mm -hmm. and they're asking if their leadership has considered a budget line for non-tenure track faculty promotion and salary increases. Uh, can you shed any light on that? Yeah, so the way we fund uh, promotion increases for our faculty is something that's important for us to, to figure out in the new budget allocation model. 
Um, I will say in my time as dean, uh, I never really liked the fact that we funded uh, tenure line promotions differently from non-tenure line promotions. So my, my priority or my, my preference and goal is that in the new uh, budget model allocation system, we fund those in the same way. So Sarah and I just actually started this conversation this week. Um, it's very much on the list of topics that we need to, to figure out. Um, but like I said, my preference is that tenure line and non-tenure line promotion salary increases be treated the same way. Thank you. Uh, we have a few questions coming in about uh, insurance and insurance changes here at the university, which is somewhat budget related. Um, so, Sarah, I believe this would be a good question for you. Uh, this employee would like to know if there's been a comprehensive look at benefits and how that could play into the overall financial strategy. Yes, absolutely. Jennifer and I have had a number of conversations about this, and we've also done some benchmarking against our Big Ten peers, and I'm happy to report we have very generous um, uh, benefits. We're going to continue to look at them to see how we can provide even better benefits, and we also have to look at the costs of those benefits as we're trying to balance the overall budget. Do you want to speak about, Sarah, with the insurance switch? Maybe that was the question. Yeah, I'd be happy to talk about it. So we just recently announced um, a change uh, in our health care benefits. That was a, a negotiation that went on for about eight months. Um, Jennifer was very involved. Um, we had a faculty member who has an expertise in this space who was critical along with the benefits team and the outcome was wonderful. Um, for the fifth year in a row, there will be no increase in employee costs, which is amazing because I can tell you the university costs have gone up. Um, but with this, this new contract, which we think will provide excellent benefits, excellent customer service, great value, we're also going to save um, money as well. So we're really, really grateful um, to be able to say there's no changes in co-pays, no changes in deductibles, no co-insurance amount changes, um, and the medical plan designs are the same as well. And if I may, Ben, um would like to quickly add, I hope you talk to colleagues in other industries because or people who work for other employers, you will see that our total rewards package, which is what you're referring to, the benefits that we provide are very generous. And even on the health insurance, to be able to say we're holding your costs the same while the university takes a significant increase, that's a wonderful benefit that we are proud to provide. So as we talk about staff morale, please do remember that there are other benefits that we provide and we are committed to continuing to provide them. Thank you. Uh, Justin, another one for you. We've had, I guess, maybe a delayed follow-up from your previous topic, but uh, specifically about adjunct professors mm -hmm. and uh, asking or saying that they feel that the salary has not kept pace with some of our competitors in the region and want to know if there are any plans to adjust that. Yes. Thank you. So our adjunct faculty really add um, a lot of value to our students and to our, our community. Um, they often bring in a unique or special expertise that we don't have in our, in our um, tenure line or non-tenure line faculty in a recurring way. And, and it's really critical that we engage with the, with the best and brightest adjuncts. The salary and compensation for adjuncts, though, is not controlled centrally. It's, um, it's really decided by deans, chancellors, in some cases, department heads. And it needs to be done in a way that is really, you know, we, we count on the deans, chancellors, department heads to understand their own market, um, you know, the, 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 uh, what it takes to get the best adjuncts to participate. And so uh, we do rely on them to, to address that. There's, so there's no central oversight or mandate in terms of what those salaries can and cannot be. Thank you. I, I was paying attention during the opening remarks, and I know that you mentioned revenue generation and how that's going to be one of the, the really central points. And so obviously was the person who asked this question. And so they're asking, is it possible, Sarah, this might be a good one for you, is Penn State planning on privatizing any of its utility systems as a way to generate revenue? Yeah, thanks for that question. So we're always looking at ways to um, streamline, to be more efficient, to create those revenue driving opportunities. Um, much of our infrastructure was created out of necessity many, many years ago. Some of our peers have, have chosen to do um, take different options for some of their infrastructure. Um, we have a responsibility to just look and explore. Some of those peers chose to make changes and some found the way they were doing it made the most sense. 
Uh, we're very sensitive to cost of attendance for our students, so we will continue to look at those opportunities. We don't have anything right now um, planned. Okay, thank you very much. And on the other end of things, in sort of saving money, what are ways that uh, employees, faculty, staff, whomever can report waste? And mm -hmm. where would the appropriate place to be that? And if you could also expand on that, perhaps if they didn't feel comfortable going to their direct supervisor. Sure, absolutely. As, as I should er said earlier, this is going to take all of us working together to get to a balanced budget. Um, I've met with a variety of units and, and employees across the university, and I'd be more than happy for you just even to send me an email with your ideas. I'm sure all of us here on the panel would be happy to hear from you. Um, it, it's going to take those creative ideas of things we've not done before or things that you observe in your day-to-day -day work. Those are the kinds of changes we're going to need to make across the university to really make a difference. So please share them with us. We would love to hear them. Thank you. Uh, Neely, did you want to add something? I did, uh, which is the fact that during the strategic hiring freeze, I actually got emails from staff. And they said, uh, you know, people saying, you are trying to control costs. I'm concerned in our unit that we are hiring such and such positions. We don't think we need it. We have capacity. Now, I never just jumped to the conclusion that that person is right because there may be contacts that we are not aware of. And so obviously we try to follow up and learn what's going on. But I thought that's wonderful. This shows that we are all in this together. We all have a big challenge uh, with all of the questions about raises and what we will do. I don't want us to lose sight of the fact that we still have 150 million, 40, 50 million dollar structural deficit we need to address in two years. So we are not going to be able to do that if we don't identify areas where we are maybe doing things we don't need to. Uh, we've been talking internally about how all teams at every level need to be discussing what should we start doing? What should we stop doing? What should we maybe delay doing? Uh, and you know, these are very, very uh, important conversations to have. Thank you, that was a good add-on. Uh, I'd like another question for Sarah, and this person would like to know, did Penn State initiate the commercial partnership program as a means to sort of combat this budget issue? And similarly, another program that is being discussed is the potential sale of alcohol at Beaver Stadium. Are these things that could help the budget? So we're definitely hoping that the commercial partnership program will help. Um, and, and it will be part of the solution for the budget, but it actually has been in process now for several years. Before I even arrived, um, Huron did a study for us figuring out how we could look at optimizing resources, um, and commercial partnerships was one of those um, opportunities. So we're grateful to, to be pursuing it. Um, selling alcohol in the stadium, really doesn't have anything to do with our budget. Um, just uh, as, a, as a point of clarification, athletics is self-sustaining. So for example, the funds that they would receive selling alcohol will be reinvested right back into their buildings and infrastructure and programs within athletics because the university does not contribute funding to athletics. Thank you. Uh, Sarah, we'll stick with you for just a little bit longer. And uh, this person is asking about Simba. And did Simba have any effect on our budget negatively? Uh, they feel that there have been some issues with the rollout and still some issues today. And why haven't those concerns been worked out a year later? Yeah, no, I, I hear about Simba a lot. Um, implementing during a pandemic is less than ideal. Um, and there were a lot of employees who worked really hard to implement Simba, despite the fact that we weren't able to do in-person training, for example. There are still a lot of improvements that need to be made to Simba, and there is a team of people within budget and finance and IT and across the university working to make those improvements. That's pretty typical for an ERP implementation as well. So we'll continue to make those improvements. We just have to slowly get through a very long list, um, and, and we'll get there. Thank you. Uh, Neely, did you want to add something? I did. Uh, one of the things is uh, for every institution, even when we feel incredible pride in the things we do well, we also need to take an honest look at ourselves and say, where are areas where perhaps we are not 
where our peers are, or where we would want to be for ourselves. And I can tell you that on a systems level and budgeting level, we are well behind our peers. So many of the problems that we face are because we didn't have one look at the budget. There's not an organization that I'm aware of, of our scale, where an $8.4 billion system, where we don't have the CFO be able to look at the entire budget. Other things we need to do are multi-year budgets, all funds budgets. So Simba, again, precedes me, but these are very important tools. So it might be painful, because we are doing something new, but honestly, for us to be doing things by Excel is unacceptable. Or homegrown systems, we cannot do that. It's too expensive because when we get these systems, someone else is investing in them to keep them up to date. So I know it's painful, but I want to say, A, thank you to the team that's been working very hard on it, and we need your help in making what we have better because we truly are behind, significantly behind in these systems. Thank you. Uh, Jennifer, we have another question for you. And this person is asking why uh, people who are being hired new to the university are making more money than people with several years of experience. And if you can explain that and answer if that's going to be looked at in the future. Yeah, yeah, thank you for that question. So sometimes that, that, that does happen. Um, and when it does, we advise units that they should put a plan in place to address the internal uh, inequity that that hire may have created. But these are things that will come about as we um, finalize the compensation process, uh, uh, part of the compensation modernization project. So those are things that we'll be looking at in more detail soon. Mm -hmm. And if I can stick with you for just a moment longer, we had another couple of people ask when job reviews, the JRWs, is that going to be a factor again? Yeah, that's a really great question, and I'm, I'm, I'm glad that someone asked it. So when, um, when we realized that the compensation modernization project was a bit delayed, we knew that we could no longer hold on, on job reviews. And I, and I want to thank all of you for your patience with us as we have worked through this project. I know that there are many of you that, that have waited a long time for job reviews. Given where we are in the project, it, it, it did, didn't make a lot of sense to say, okay, you're in this job profile now and we're going to move you to this job profile because in the new system, we're going to have all new job profiles. So what we did, though, was allowed for units to make adjustments um, to salary if an adjustment was warranted and if the unit could could support it. So that is an option that is, is available, um, but we will likely get back to a normal process of, of reviewing jobs in 2020. 23 once we get through the entire project. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Uh, Neely, I have a question for you, and we've received a few inquiries coming in, uh, concerns about our drop in the U.S. News ranking. Uh, they noted that if one does have a higher ranking, then you attract more students, more high-tier faculty, and then that is sort of a cyclical nature that helps you raise the university's profile. So what is the university doing to address this? It's a very good question. Uh, it's a tough question to answer because many of us know the flaws in the system, right? Because with US News and World Report, this year they changed a methodology on how they report our overall graduation rates, for example. And that we think is a key factor in why our drop ranking dropped. Not the only factor, not the only reason, but one of the factors. But the reality is for people, uh, outside, so if it's students, if it's parents, if it's donors, alumni, they may look at this and they may view us as sore losers. You know, you're complaining about the rules because you didn't do so well. So part of what we need to do is have a very clear sense of mission. What is it we want to do? What are the metrics that matter to us? And at the same time, we will pursue uh, with US News and World Report, I want to have a conversation with them on why we think the current metrics maybe don't make sense. We may not succeed, in which case we may also look at what are the other rankings that are out there? Are there things that matter to us? Maybe it's social mobility, it's our research, it's our international rankings. So let's continue this. I'm not trying to evade the question, it's just a tough question. I will tell you, is it tomorrow, Justin, that we have our briefing or Friday? Friday. Friday. On Friday, I've asked for a briefing 
for our, this team and a few others to really understand the nuances of the rankings. And I think that we've just got to be honest and say it does matter to large sections of the population, and we are going to do everything we can to demonstrate how tremendous Penn State is. You know this, and in the short time I've been here, I know this. So we'll need your help, too. On some of these, we'll need all of us to speak with one voice. Thank you for addressing that. Uh, Sarah, I think this next one would be good for you. We had someone ask specifically about the budget allocation model you mentioned that's going to start in November. Can you explain what that means to the just average general staff member? Yeah, it's a great question. So right now, each unit gets a budget allocation. And to be completely honest, we're not exactly sure how that allocation was even derived. It's it's legacy. It's called an incremental budget, which basically means you get the same amount you got the year before, and sometimes there's a little bit of changes. And it really has not kept up with enrollment changes, for example, or other priorities the university has that we want to financially provide resources for. So we're really starting over. Um, there is a EAB um, uh, article that we're using. It's not a rule book. I want to be really clear that it's not telling us what to do, but it's guiding us and telling us here are the decision points you need to think through. So our group of about a dozen is working every week through each of these 13 decision points and then adding some of our own that are important to the nuances of Penn State as we think about how do we want to fund maybe student credit hours? How do we want to provide incentives for values that are important to us, like DEIB or interdisciplinary um, research. research? All of those individual pieces. And so all those ingredients, I'll say, will go into this budget allocation model, will help us figure out how the pie that we have gets sliced across both the academic colleges, the campuses, and the non-academic units. And then we will work with the budget executives and the financial officers to say, here's what we think is the right model, get their feedback, make appropriate tweaks, and then give those allocations out to the units so that they can then decide the best way to use those resources along with the other resources they have to balance their budgets. Uh, Justin, I think you have something you'd like to add? Sure, I'd just like, <clears throat> excuse me. I'd like to just add a bit to what Sarah just said about the process for building the budget allocation model because I had the same question when we started and she had to explain it to me. Um, so we have Nakubo as advisors and we have this article that Sarah's referred to. Their primary roles are not to make decisions or influence decisions that we make. Um, the EAB article gives us a, a framework for how to ask the questions and, and what sequence we should think about the questions. But the piece that we, we also should stress here is that the first thing that we did in that, that team uh, wasn't a Nakubo recommendation or an EAB article recommendation. It was let's spend our first meeting or so just talking about what we value at Penn State. Let's make sure that we identify the core mission, vision, values for our university so that every time we have these decision points and, and conversations, we're always referring back to student success, student access, student affordability, faculty success, faculty ability to do creative interdisciplinary research um, and, and stick to our core value of being the best interdisciplinary uh, university in the country. Um, in addition to what Sarah pointed to, how do we ensure that we continue to um, support actively uh, the diversification of our faculty, which is a, a really an important thing for us to, to keep working on and pay attention to. So we talk a lot about um, you know, a lot of the, the financial detailed terms in terms of how do we allocate or, or assess budgets. But fundamentally, we're trying to do this in a way that is, is constantly reflecting on what is the vision, because the vision, mission, and values really is the goal, and we want to have an allocation model that lets us do that. And we have a, a group across the university helping us think about mm -hmm. what that looks like in their worlds too, right? right. So we have the staff advisory council, mm -hmm. we have the faculty senate, we've got people from the campuses and people from all the colleges and um, administrative units because they all have a different perspective on it that's really right. helpful right. for right. us. And, and it's important to remember as we do this that we are <clears throat> the most complicated university in the United States, hands down. Mm -hmm. We are the only one that has 
one budget process, 24 campuses and University Park, um, professional schools, right? So we are, we are the most complex institution. Um, <clears throat> we really believe in access and affordability and the land grant mission, but we also are a research one university with a billion dollars a year in research expenditures. We have an international presence, right? Penn State Global is, is important to us. So it's a complicated, system that we have to build, and we're trying to do it in a, in a truly mindful way that involves everyone's input. Thank you both for your input on that one. Uh, Neely, we have a question for you. Uh, one of our submitters noted earlier and thanked you for your support for the Commonwealth campuses, but would like to know if you could expand on that a little bit and uh, tell us what some of your ideas and uh, to support the campuses more. Uh, glad, glad to do that. Um, Justin actually did a great job of laying out what is so special about Penn State. I mean, some of you may know, I, I don't know why you would, but when Penn State first reached out to me, I said no. Uh, you know, because I said I still have lots of things to do. I was very happy at my institution. And then I'm so glad that they were pleasantly persistent and said, look at it again. Because the more I looked at Penn State, I could not agree more. There is no other university like Penn State in this country. And that's what intrigued me, the complexity of it, the fact that we can impact an entire state when you look at it. So the Commonwealth campuses, we need to think through how do we support. And it's only by chance. I won't show you which one, but you can verify <laughs> that it's a Commonwealth campus notebook because <laughs> I don't want people to say, why did you pick that one? <laughs> so it truly was a factor. During the search process, I told the board that I was very intrigued by the access and affordability mission. My own life was changed through higher education. And I loved the idea that we have these campuses where we are not going to offer every single major. That makes no sense. We can't have the resources to do that. But if we can be responsive to the local economy, if we can be responsive to the needs there and say, you can stay close to home, you can save money, and you can get a Penn State degree. So what is the Penn State degree? Faculty and staff, we love to think it's only about what we do in the classroom. It's not. Beyond that, what we provide in the classroom, the support in and out that faculty and staff contribute to is great, but it's also the students that we attract, who they work with, the alumni. So the way that I've been talking about the Commonwealth campuses is what else can we do there? How are we going to be part and parcel of the workforce talent pipeline discussion. Can we use our campuses to advance rural health? Because we're right there. So I cannot say there's one specific answer because my tagline, if you will, is that not all great ideas come from old Maine. Some of them better, otherwise we shouldn't be paid. <laughs> but one of the things we did with Commonwealth campuses is recently uh, I asked Kelly Austin to convene and he did a great job bringing all the chancellors together so they could talk to one another and share what each of them is doing particularly well. That's the strength of a system so that we can then say, how do we combine these ideas? Because I do think they are a gem in our system and that they add tremendously to who we are and to what we are. We're going to have to get you a notebook that has every campus on so no one feels left out. That's fair. Okay. Speaking of our entire broad state, what is the university doing to address the demographic shift? And how can we attract people when Pennsylvania as a state is losing people? Uh, tremendous questions. You are right. Um, I remember starting on this work seven, eight years ago at other universities I was at. We called it the, you know, it's called the demographic cliff. I'm sure you're all familiar with it. That somewhere from 2025 for a decade, uh, the college going, the traditional college going rate is going to go down. And it's particularly, particularly an issue in the Commonwealth because net, we are, we are not growing. Our population is not growing as fast as other places. So what do we do? It's a multifactorial problem, so it's not one particular solution. We need to be paying attention to retention. Remember, we've talked about this. It's not just for faculty and staff. The students that we now have, what are we doing to retain them and graduate them? It's both financially good for us and socially from a mission point of view, it's important. 
because when a student drops out, it's the worst of all possible worlds. They have debt and nothing to show for it. The second thing we need to do is to be very mindful of how we are doing our enrollment management. The Latino, Latina population in this uh, Commonwealth is growing, probably the only sector that's growing. What are we doing? Are we being sensitive? And there are best practices in some campuses. So why do we all have to reinvent the wheel? What are we going to do there? Are we being good about bringing adult learners back who may have dropped out for different reasons to help them complete their college degree? And also rethinking, it's not just degrees. What are we doing for lifelong learning? So as I said, there's many, many uh, ways we need to look at it. So as a provost, I started the uh, Project 2025. At Louisville, as president, we started talking about the demographic cliff four years ago. So we need to be doing the same thing here. Thank you. Uh, Sarah, Jennifer, we have a question for you, and it's a, a very tactical question. Would the university ever consider offering uh, compensating or offering a financial assistance or uh, incentive to employees that don't take our insurance, maybe they have insurance through a spouse or through personal, uh, to offset the savings to the university? I, I, may I answer that? Sure, absolutely. <laughs> You're the president. <laughs> <laughs> I am the president. I also wanted to say I don't think it's a decision we can make here. Those big decisions will need to be approved by the board. So I didn't mean to cut them off uh, in uh, what we say, but certainly, please, both of you feel free to answer. I'll, I'll just say I don't think it's something that we have discussed, but it certainly is something that we can explore more. Mm -hmm. Sarah? Yeah, I was going to say the same thing, <laughs> Jennifer. Yeah. Okay, and then uh, one final question, Neely, this one is for you. Uh, this person very much appreciated your efforts at gender equity at the senior level, but we're interested to know if that would trickle down to some of the lower level staff members. It absolutely should, and it absolutely must. Um, I hope none of you take this the wrong way, but having, as somebody who's been in higher education and who's been in the world of business, I will tell you, higher education, we talk a good game. We talk a good game about diversity, about equity, about inclusion, about belonging, but we actually lag many of our private sector peers. And what I'm really proud of, and I want you to know, our board gets this. They're actually saying, what are you doing? Are you keeping up? So for example, it's called ESG reports that we provide at a corporate level, is what are we doing on all of these issues at every single level? Okay. Thank you. And Mary. again, no false promises. Remember, we still have a slog ahead of us, but I'm very confident, people. Very, very, very confident. It's gonna be a tough 12 to 18 months, but we gave our word that by 2025, we will get to a balanced budget. So, but yes, that's a guiding principle for me. Thank you very much. Uh, we have already gone over our allotted time and there were a few questions that we didn't get to. Thank you so much for submitting them. We will make every effort to follow up with those as soon as possible. Stay tuned to Penn State Today where we will announce the form that those answers will take. I thank you for submitting questions. Thank you to our panel for answering those questions. And thank you to WPSU, our production partners, for making this beautiful thing happen today. A uh, quick reminder that there will be another town hall at 11 focused on questions questions from students and their family members. But as we wrap up today, Dr. Bendapudi, would you leave us with a few words? Just to say thank you. Uh, I, this is an honor, a privilege, a pleasure to be president of Penn State. And I will confidently tell you that this is the job I want to retire from. And I will say that our future is bright. Our best days are ahead of us. And there's nothing we cannot do because we are Penn State. So thank you so much and be well, everybody. Be kind to yourself and be kind to one another. Uh, that's what my mom used to tell me every single day. So I will tell you that too.